Presented by Caltech. So I have a lot of uh, demonstrations of standing waves here. So I want to try this thing first. You hear the air, let's see. And it makes a noise. Maybe not too loud. It's a slide whistle. I can change the length. I can change the length of the cavity in there and that changes the frequency. So it changes the boundary condition and where the boundary conditions are on the standing wave. But there's really just one thing I want to show with this. So I have boundary conditions that is basically closed at both ends. And I can open this end. Closed. Open. So by changing the boundary condition at this end from closed to open or back to closed, you, you see a very noticeable effect on the frequency. Low frequency, high frequency. Okay, so you should be able to understand that in terms of the boundary conditions. And you'll be able to think about that some on your homework too. So that's the slide whistle. This is a Shive wave machine, somebody asked. So that's what this is that we've been using actually quite a bit. So we put traveling waves on it. We can also put a standing wave on it if I... So you can see the roughly that uh, where the peak amplitudes are is at a constant place. So I just have a standing wave that I'm putting on this. So you can put standing waves or traveling waves on, on media. This one's kind of fun. On the screens. It's just a loop of wire that's connected to a vibrator, a speaker's coil, basically. So I can change the frequency on it. Right around there. Oops, wrong way. Where did I have it? There. Okay. It's pretty sensitive. This is at 20 hertz, 21, 22. It already is off, off the resonance. So now I'm going in one tenth increments, so I can really find the maximum. So it's really distorting a lot. But I can also see if I can find other modes just by changing the frequency. So uh, I'm way off resonance now. Here we go. Oh, 
So just with a simple wire. And you could ask yourself why it has the behavior it has. I have one, two, three, four, five anti-nodes here. At the other time, I, at the lower frequency, I had three. It's, it goes up by two at a time. So better boundary conditions on this thing, as usual. Can do it with water. Tone, get a little louder. So let's see, let me raise this a little bit. I like it a little higher. So I can change the frequency. And you should be able to hear the intensity vary as I get to where it's actually a good standing wave. it. So right, over, right around there, okay? That's 261 hertz. Of course, I can change the length and that decreases it. That's no longer the resonance. So should I go up or should I go down? It's longer, so the wavelength's going to be longer, so the frequency's going to be lower. again because I'm passing it. So now that's 186 hertz. I think, I think I've got about the maximum. I turned the volume down before. So we're just making a standing wave. This is uh, more or less open at one end and closed at the other end. So you can figure out how the waves go in there to make a standing wave, what the boundary conditions are. So This one's really neat. So I just have a string here. It's got about 300 grams on the other end and it's attached to another speaker coil here. And it's wiggling the, uh, wiggling the string around. It's just moving a few millimeters up and down, centimeter maybe. So let me change the frequency of this and see if I can find a normal mode. So I'm looking for, well, I'm pretty close to one now, I guess. It's got one, two, three-ish there. Let me go down a little farther and see if I can find a lower one. That seems about like the fundamental, just one half wavelength in the thing. So I can try going up. So this is at four hertz. So if I go uh, double that, I should get the next one. That's eight. It's at least close. Twelve. Sixteen-ish. It's probably a little. Whoops! I canceled it out. Sixteen's good. Oops. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's it. Twenty point four there. So I should be able to go to 40.8 and get 10. It's a 
little harder to see, but it's doing pretty good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Got ten. Try for twenty. So it gets the amplitude gets smaller, so it's a little harder to see. I think I've got it maxed to about 73.9 now. And if you look carefully, you can see that it's vibrating. Okay, and, and if you count it, it, I hope it's 20. But I'm not gonna take the time to count it. So standing waves on a string, standing waves in the water, acoustic standing waves. We've started to talk about multi-dimensions and in particular we're doing uh, a circular drum head which we'll finish analyzing. Uh, but let me try another one that's two-dimensional over here. It's called the Schladley plate. I have trouble saying those constants next to each other. Um, Okay. No. It should be that one. Okay. So it's just a plate of metal. It looks dirty. It's because that's because it has sand on the top of it. And the hope is that if I can excite normal modes in it, that there will be nodes and anti-nodes and that the sand will gravitate towards the nodes where, where they'll be in more or less equilibrium. So sometimes I get this to work fine and sometimes I don't. So let's see how it works. Let's try this one. So you can kind of see the pattern forming. So it's got, so it, the pattern follows the symmetry of the triangle that I'm using, and it has, I guess you can see, so you see a node there, a node, node. So if I mix it up, Let's see if I can find another node. Let's try this one. Right in the middle. I may not be able to do this one. Sorry if you have sensitive ears. That's probably enough to see the pattern. It's quite different. Before, remember, the nodes were along lines like this. Now it's like this. There used to be a node there, but now they're like this. So it's a higher, this is a higher frequency mode. It's all a matter of where I excited it on the, on the edge. Let's, let's try another point and then we'll then we'll move on.
So there are far fewer nodes on, on this one. It's a lower frequency. What kind of one? There, there, and there, and maybe there's something going on in the center, but it doesn't look like there is. So that's a two-dimensional standing wave. And that's the analysis that we're going to do now on the circular drum head. So we started this last time. <clears throat> I put the recap of where we are up there. So we took out the time dependence and are working on the spatial dependence. It's two-dimensional spatial dependence. Because of the circular symmetry, we used polar coordinates, angle and our radius. And we wrote our standing wave function u of x as a product of a term that depends on r and a term that depends on theta. So we separated the two variables out. So it's called separation of variables in solving partial differential equations. It's a standard technique that's applied in many uh, uh, examples. <clears throat> so now our goal, and of course, once we've separated the variables and found solutions for r of r and theta of theta, then the idea is that we can put superpositions of these together and make more complicated solutions to our wave equation or to our Helmholtz equation in this case. So the point to notice here that we were noticing last time is this term here is independent of theta. And this term here is independent of r. So this is just a constant as far as r is concerned. Therefore, in order to get 0, this also has to be a constant independent of r. So this is independent of r. And this, likewise, is independent of theta. There are just two constants that add up to get 0. So they're the same constant with a minus sign in between. Okay. That is, I can write. Uh, 1 over equals a constant. Or I can multiply through by the function theta and get d squared by d theta squared. Uh, theta is equal to, uh, well, let's, let's put it all on the same side. So plus some constant that I'll call c squared times theta is equal to 0. So I've just rearranged this equation and defined a quantity called theta. But this is a differential. It's a second order linear homogeneous differential equation. We know what the solution is. Theta is just equal to some constant times e to the plus or minus i c theta. It's just our sines and cosines all over again. <clears throat> but that's not quite the full story. got a differential equation. We have boundary conditions. Well, there's one boundary condition that we immediately can oppose on this, and that is the fact that it's just a continuous circle. Nothing should happen when we go past 2 pi. We should have the value of the function smoothly continue across it, and the value of the function at 2 pi should be the same as the value of the function at 0. So therefore, <coughs> Theta at theta plus 2 pi, where theta is any angle, is equal to theta evaluated at theta. And so therefore, 
C, that constrains what value C could have. C must, C must be, um, must be just an integer, right? Integer, n equals zero, one, two. In order for it to return to the same value. And we have, and I can write this explicitly in terms of sines and cosines. So it could be cosine and theta, it could be sine and theta. And in fact, if we consider the possibility that n is equal to 0, I said included n equals 0 here. Of course, the sign goes away, and you get the trivial solution. You don't care about that. Uh, but cosine of 0 times theta is a constant. C equals n equals 0. <clears throat> Let's try that in the differential equation, d squared theta by d theta squared. <clears throat> so if this is 0, we get the second derivative is equal to 0. And so that implies that theta is equal to um, a times theta plus b. But our boundary condition tells us that a is 0. So this function evaluated at theta and theta plus 2 pi is the same at those two angles as long as a is equal to 0. So in fact, this. This solution is covered here in the cosine term, so I don't need to worry about something special. <clears throat> so we've done part of our solution. In the separation of variables, we've got a solution for the angular dependence, sines and cosines. Now we need to worry about the radial dependence. So the equation for R once I substitute in my solution for theta, I just substitute that in there, I get uh, I get an n squared or a minus n squared there. <coughs> And so my solution for r becomes 1 over r, r, d by d, r of r, d by d, r of r plus k squared, r squared minus n squared is equal to 0, where that's the n that comes from the sine and the cosine. <clears throat> so let's see. So. I can uh, multiply this all out, and I get d squared by d r squared of um, r. Let me work that part out. Okay, plus a one over r dr by dr. Okay. So a lot of working these things out is just kind of rewriting them in different ways until you get what you want. So I'm going to I'm going to divide. So I'm going to multiply out this this r this big r there, and I'm going to divide through by little r squared and get d squared by d r squared of capital R plus. Uh, a 1 over r, let's see. You've probably been staring at this, wondering how I got this. It's because I already had divided out by the, divided out uh, something. Uh, let's see, so what's the answer here? So this is a 1 over, this is an r squared plus an r. I think I've got it right now. Okay. 
So I'm going to divide out this r squared. So that becomes just d squared by dr. This becomes a 1 over r, dr by dr, plus, so I got something here. So what's left here is k squared minus n squared over, uh, da, 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 da. I wrote n squared, which I should be n squared over r squared, right? Is equal to zero. <clears throat> so that is my radial equation. It's a second order linear homogeneous differential equation. It's a little complicated. Yeah. So the n squared is this n squared. Because what I did was I plugged this back into my differential equation there. And the d squared by d theta squared gave a minus n squared. And then the theta, the capital theta is cancel. Because I, you know, once I take the second derivative of this, I get a minus n squared cos n theta. Is that clear? <clears throat> okay, so this nice little equation is known as Bessel's equation. You know, it's, it's just another second order differential equation just like this is except it's a little more complicated, and so the answers aren't sines and cosines, they're Bessel functions. So posted on the website, there's a little derivation of the Bessel functions that we need. And you could have solved this equation the same, same way I did the Bessel equation, expanded in a power series. So here you would get the power series for sines and cosines. When you do this one, you get the power series for a Bessel function. There's a couple little technical details in there that, that you can look at. But if you work with power series, you, you know how to solve this equation. Okay? It's just that the solution is you know, a power series, just like the sines and cosines are power series. Uh, they're just a little less familiar, and they're called Bessel functions. That is, R of R is equal to J sub N of KR. Just like there's a sine and a cosine, there are two, it's a second order differential equation, there are two Bessel function solutions. So a general solution would be a superposition, a linear superposition of, of such, of these. <coughs> But we can eliminate one of these right away. <clears throat> the y sub n are singular functions at r equals 0. <clears throat> and there's nothing singular about our drum head there. It's the 0 is not, not really any different than any, anywhere else. It's just a continuous medium across r equals 0. So we throw these solutions out. Our behavior can't be, can't be that. So that's like another boundary condition that we've applied. <clears throat> so we only have the J sub ends left. They're not singular at uh, R equals zero. 
So our solutions. So the solutions y sub n, say, of r, theta, and time, let's put the time dependence back, is our u functions, r u of r of theta, e to the plus or minus i omega t. And so I can write it down as j sub n kr cosine n theta or sine n theta or some linear combination of these and e to the plus or minus i omega t. That's one way to write, the, yeah. Blows up. It's like it has, like as, as r goes to zero, it has uh, one over r to some power dependence. So it's, uh, it's not, a, not a nice continuous quantity across r equals zero. Sorry. Um, I'm this y? Yeah. This is a lowercase y. That's a capital Y. They're different. Okay, so this is what I'm calling, so, so this is what, I, what I'm calling my solution to the wave equation. Oh, okay. I, I may have called it something different up there. I called it f up there. But so y is f. Sorry, I shouldn't change notation like, like that on you. But this is my wave equation solution. <clears throat> okay, so the general solution is a superposition. Remember, it's a linear equation. <clears throat> so if I have <clears throat> two solutions to it, any linear combination of those solutions is also a solution. <clears throat> so y of r theta t can be written as a superposition from n equals zero to infinity of a sub n of, say, call it y sub n. Let me call this, I, I said r there. It should, be an, should have been an n. You're probably worried about that, too. Um, y sub n, and I'm going to call that a u sub n, if you like, a sub n, y sub n of r theta n. So I'm just taking a linear superposition of terms of this form where the u sub n looks like this part here. So these y sub n can be considered to be our basis functions or basis vectors. And, and the idea is that we have some infinite dimensional vector space that we can expand our arbitrary solution to the wave equation in. And these act, you know, they act like x, y, z components, except it's infinite number of directions and some infinite dimensional vector space, which is a function space. <clears throat> so let's take a look uh, at what the solutions might actually look like. We've got a real drum head. What might the modes actually look like? So to obtain the, the normal modes, we've got a little bit more work to do. We've got to consider the boundary condition at r equals a. Our wave function should go to zero at r equals a. Okay, And we haven't done that yet. We haven't imposed that yet. So we have boundary conditions that we must have that the r dependence at r equals a, we must have that that's equal to zero. So these j sub n are functions that look like whatever they look like. 
They got wiggles in them. They tend to decrease as you go out. You know, they look a lot like sines and cosines that are tempered by some decrease. And the spacing of, of the zeros of them, I've almost, almost drawn it in a reasonable way, uh, is a little more complicated. They're not evenly spaced. So this condition implies certain k values, and hence frequency. That is, if uh, n equals 0, or maybe 4n equals 0, j sub 0 of x is equal to 0 at uh, x equals 2.4, 5.5, and so forth. They're, you know, they're not evenly spaced things. It's not 2.4, 4.8, it's 2.4, 5.5. So those are the zeros of, of j0 of x. Um, and so, so for example, for the first zero, we would have Ka equals 2.4. This thing's in the way, isn't it? Oh, we'll go over there. <coughs> See people trying to look around that. <coughs> Um, so Ka would be 2.4, and then if you know what the velocity is, you know that the velocity is just omega over K, and so given K, so A is some fixed number, that means K is 2.4 over A, here I am writing over here again, um, and then that implies a value for omega equals K times V. So our frequencies are quantized by our boundary condition. That, well, that's our normal modes. That's our standing waves. So we shouldn't be surprised. Let's see. So the normal modes look something like the following. If n is equal to 0, so here's our drum head. So the drum head moves up and down, so out of the board and into the board. I'm going to put a plus if it's out of the board and a minus if it's into the board. So the lowest mode is one where the whole thing is going out and then going in and then going out. So this is a picture at a given instant of time where it has a plus sign. Some instant later, it'll have a minus sign. Okay. And this is the mode that corresponds to Ka is equal to 2.4. So it's n equals 0. So the n equals 0, remember, is just a constant in angle. So there's no angular dependence, just, just flat. And it's the lowest mode in the radial direction. The whole thing just bows up and then bows down and just oscillates back and forth. The next radial mode is one where I have plus and minus. So the center part's coming up, but the outer part's going down. It's oscillating back and forth like that. And so this is kr is equal to 2.4. That's our first zero of the Bessel function. And the next one is ka equals 5.5 to get the boundary condition on the, on the outside of the drum. <clears throat> so, and this just keeps going. For n equals 0, there's never any angular dependence. I just add additional circles, concentric circles, for additional uh, modes, additional standing waves. <clears throat> So, so if I had a circular Cialdini plate, I, you know, I would hopefully be able to excite that mode with just a, 
uh, a single circle there. <clears throat> For n equals 1, so j1 of x is equal to 0 at x equals 3.8, 7.0, and so forth. Okay, there are an infinite number of zeros as you go up. Uh, so let's see. So for n equals 1, there's angular dependence now, too. So it could be a sine or it could be a cosine. One of them is going to look like this. The other one is going to be orthogonal. It's going to look like this. And this is the solution where Ka is equal to 3.8. So there's no additional radial excitation. So the radial dependence is, is simple. If I go to Ka equals 7.0, I'll get something that looks like this, and then maybe something that looks like this, plus, minus, plus, minus. And I have an orthogonal mode of the same frequency where I just rotate it 90 degrees. So these are orthogonal modes. So a, any linear superposition of these is, is allowed. Okay? They're, they're distinct modes. They have the same frequency, so they're degenerate. But, they, uh, but there are two different elements in our set of basis functions. And we could go on. We could do uh, uh, n equals 2. So then we get something that looks like this. Or we could add, uh, you know, we could add uh, radial dependence to that. Questions about this? <clears throat> yeah. Um, what happens to the contribution from the theta function, capital theta? That's what's that's what's given the angular dependence. Okay. I thought we Oh, that, that, was what, that was for n equals 0. So that was these. So that was the constant. So that was, that was n equals 0 is the b. But then, then we have <coughs> n equals 1 will be a, a sine theta or a cosine theta. So you'll get it going up and down. Okay, so that's standing waves. We've done standing waves. And you'll have some problems in your homework to think about these. But I hope, having seen this, they'll be fairly easy. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we've talked about superposition. You put waves together and they, they add and subtract according to their signs and, and their magnitude and so forth. And so that leads to the next topic, which is just interference. And diffraction, which the book <coughs> treats in the same breath, because they're really kind of the same thing. <coughs> it's all superposition. If you've got two solutions to the wave equation, you can add them together and have another solution. Well, when you add solutions together, they can interfere with each other. They add and subtract. They give, they give you the, the, the sum of the two waves. 
So I want to think about light waves for a bit. <clears throat> So we're going to be thinking more and more about light waves. So in a vacuum, <clears throat> so we can have light waves propagate in a vacuum, as you know, uh, and then propagate at the speed of light, roughly 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. In a material, with some index of refraction. And greater than 1, <coughs> V is C over N. So for example, the index of refraction for glass is around 1 and a half. So you get something like two-thirds the speed of light in glass. So I'm going to go through some, so there's a note posted on EM waves that I mentioned before. Yeah. There, yes, but you have to be a little careful because orthogonality is defined a little bit different than what you're used to. I should, uh, I don't even think I put that in the note. I might have it in the note. But so there'll be some function that multiplies them in some way. But you have an integral, Jn, Jm, something, dx, dr, whatever is equal to zero, or is equal to delta something. Maybe if I remember, I'll, I'll, I'll do it next. I don't remember it off the end. Yeah. Otherwise, this gives you some, uh, so there are weird materials, <coughs> but we never, so, so far, we've never found anything that, such that we're able to propagate the information faster than the speed of light. So and and N's goal is going to, for, for anything we do here, we're not going to get too weird. So we're going to consider materials with N is bigger than one. But you can have materials that have imaginary components and other things going on. So, and they lead to strange, interesting phenomena. They're, I mean, they're interesting materials. And, and have interesting uses too. But, uh, but for our purpose, uh, I mean, okay, if you worked out the theory for what the index refraction of a material is, you see that there's some assumptions that you're making about how the, you know, it's all atomic physics. And, and we're, 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 try, we're trying to, to treat that atomic physics as sort of a bulk phenomena. And the individual atoms may be doing things a little bit differently than what you what you think. So as you know, as you go on, you may come across materials that behave in funny ways compared to what we are doing here. <clears throat> okay. So the next thing I wanted to do, I don't have time for. So and I don't want to use these boards. <laughs> so let me just remind you a little bit about where we're going, and then we'll quit. And I've lost my eraser, too. Here it is. So we're talking about light waves, that is electromagnetic waves, so we can just talk about electromagnetism in general. So we're going to consider electromagnetic waves in a, first of all, let's consider a, a uniform isotropic lossless 
static medium. If I relax some of these, that might be where I get strange indices of refraction. I mean, you know that if you start adding a loss function somewhere, that you tend to get imaginary frequencies. That's the damping coefficient. So things like that can happen with the M waves too. And let's see. Let's assume that there's no sources either. Rho is equal to zero. Our current is equal to zero. That is, there's no free charges and no free current. We may be in a medium, and the medium has electrons and, and protons in them, uh, so it's not, and they're moving. Uh, but those properties are once again getting lumped into things like the index of refraction. They're getting lumped into the uh, dielectric behavior and the uh, permittivity, the, uh, not the, the permeability, magnetic permeability. So I'm going to use SI units. And I'm going to write down Maxwell's equations. I'm going to write the differential form for them. <coughs> L dot D is equal to zero. L cross H is equal to DD by DT. So these are vectors here. Del <coughs> dot B is equal to zero. Of course, this would be rho if rho weren't zero up here. <coughs> Del cross E is equal to minus dB by dt. And in a material like this, we have that D is, so the D field, the displacement field, is related to the electric field by the dielectric constant, which is by the uh, permittivity. Yeah. D. OK. So if there's no medium, if there's nothing with, a dielectric, uh, with, with dielectric behavior, this would just be E. D and E are basically the same, except in, in one case, you're kind of taking out the fact that there are internal fields in the material. The same between B and H. So, so uh, we also have. B is equal to the magnetic permeability times H. So, so we're going to use these Maxwell's equations. So if, if you're rusty on them, there is the note on the web that, that goes through this again and, and does more detail than I'll do in class about, about how things are working. Uh, but So I'm getting the possible vibration that maybe people haven't had D and H fields in physics one. So maybe we have to spend a little time on that. Okay, but we're done today.